Good evening and welcome. Welcome back, I should say, to Hawk Tank. This is our fast pitch event that provides the opportunity for Miami women to empower the world. For the past two years, Hawk Tank has been done online through a series of pre recorded videos. And while the projects were no less important, nor me, nor, um, and we're incredibly impactful. Tonight, we are so happy to bring the excitement of the Life Pitch competition back to Oxford and to those watching via live stream. As the ambassador of Miami University and a member of Miami Women's Steering Committee, I take great pleasure and pride in being here tonight to act as MC for this wonderful program. Since the inaugural Hawk Tank in 2018, the Miami Women's Giving Circle has given away nearly half a million dollars in support of meaningful programs. Wow. <laughs> Those projects have had a tremendous impact on Miami University and we're so grateful for your support. This year, 70 applicants were submitted in a broad range of areas, mental health, research, club sports, nutrition, and many more. Our grants committee had a very difficult job of narrowing it down to the 16 finalists who you will see tonight seeking funding from the Miami Women Giving Circle. The Miami Women Giving Circle is a collective giving effort that allows participants to combine resources with other members and make a greater impact on the Miami community. The collective power of each member's annual $1,000 gift creates a large pool of money that funds multiple vital projects. The final determination of which project receive funding is in the hands of you, Miami Women Giving Circle members. Their $1,000 annual commitment has earned them the power of the vote. While we have many joining us in the audience and via live stream, I'd like to ask the Giving Circle members here tonight to please stand and be recognized. Thank you so very much for your support. Tonight, we have 16 projects with a total ask of nearly $198,000. This year's Giving Circle Fund is 100,000. So you have a tough task indeed to determine which groups will be selected to receive funding. We thank the entire Miami community for its continued support. If anyone in attendance tonight is inspired to join the effort of the Miami Women Giving Circle, we have information at the registration table or at the QR code on your flyer. Okay, it is time to the task at hand. Voting members have booklets in front of them containing details on each of the 16 vital finalists and some opportunity for you to take notes. The listing is in pitch order, which was randomly selected. Non-voting members can scan the QR code to access additional information. Each of our 16 finalists has spent the last several weeks practicing their pitch for tonight. Working with Beth Troy, an assistant lecturer in the Farmer School of Business, they have crafted their individual three-minute presentation. Voting members, please listen carefully and make notes. Voting on the project will open after the last presentation and remain open until 10 p.m. Eastern time tonight. We'll go over more of these details at the very end. In order to respect the short time of all presentations and allow our voters and panelists to hear, please silence cell phones and step outside with personal matters and please keep side conversations to a minimum. Are you ready? Let's get started and introduce our first presenter. Creating fluorescent newts by genome editing to study lens regeneration. Presented by Katie Schuckman. Good 
Good evening, everyone. I would like you all to take a moment, close your eyes, and imagine a scientist. What do they look like? What are they wearing? What are they doing? By a show of hands, how many of you imagined a female scientist? If you imagined a female scientist, you are actually in the minority of the youth of America. The draw scientist test has been used in elementary and middle schools for nearly 50 years for the purpose of understanding where student stereotypes regarding gender in the science field begin. Most students will imagine a crazy mad scientist with some sort of explosion in the background, or a male with crazy glasses, crooked and crazy facial hair, and yet again, an explosion in the background. This perception of male dominance in the science field causes girls to internalize that they do not belong in STEM fields. Growing up, I never believed that I belonged in a STEM field. I would feel a sense of imposter syndrome as I would sit in my classes of upper level science classes in a room of 20 boys to only three girls, myself included. However, my perspective shifted when I came to Miami University looking for a research lab and I found one directed by a well-established female researcher. Since that day, I have looked up to my advisor, Dr. Katia Del Rio Sonis, our lab manager, Erica, and all of the women who I collaborated with on this project, who I now call my friends, as women I hope to one day become. Having these women as examples to look up to has empowered me to take on challenges that I never thought possible before, including it standing in front of all of you here today. Now, as a sophomore undergraduate and a woman in the science field, I am proposing a project to you all today that will carry me through the rest of my career here at Miami. How many of you are affected by cataracts or know someone who suffers from cataracts? Our project is part of a bigger goal to find permanent treatments for degenerative lens diseases such as cataracts. In particular, we study salamander lens regeneration. You can imagine the salamander's eye as a circle and once the lens is removed, the top portion of the circle will begin to regenerate and form a new lens. However, this bottom portion never does. Our goal is to induce lens regeneration from this bottom portion through the use of gene editing tools. One of these tools will be a green protein that we will use to track the progress of our reaction. And once we are successful, we will get colorful green newt eyes. The understanding of these mechanisms will allow us to adapt and manipulate these processes for human regeneration. In summary, I believe the empowerment of women is essential to the discipline of science and to society as a whole to empower women to become leaders. If given the opportunity to carry out this project, I hope to be an example to future scientists, to future women, to empower and motivate them into believing that they can do anything that they set their mind to. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Katie. And next, we have Miami Regional's Peer Health Educator, presented by Zoe Shank. A female with or without children juggling full-time school and their education at the poverty line, if not below, is the traditional regional student that you are going to see on our campuses. These students often come into the college experience with their cards already stacked up against them because of the social determinants of health that are affecting their ability to be successful in their educational journey. These barriers include being a single mom, being a first generation student, being an immigrant, having low income, and the list goes on. These students already come in aware that they have no room for second chances they have little to no support behind them and they already feel behind. So with that being said, according to the ACHA, only 44% of students nationwide believe that their university values their health as a priority. Let me repeat that. Only 44% of students believe that their university values your health. Let me put this into perspective for you. On our regional campuses, between the Middletown and Hamilton campus, there is one counselor. That counselor has been on a wait list consecutively for the last two years. So this leaves students with little ability to get the intervention they need for their needs. This is leaving us with the question, how do even 44% of our students feel that we are prioritizing their health? So, 
this left us with the idea, let's make a student organization where we can provide students with not only education, but the tools to equip them to be successful in not only their educational journey, but their professional journey after school. Our goal is to equip those students with those tools, which would be stress management, time management, sleep health, coping with mental health, nutrition, and so on. The Miami University Regional Peer Health Educators are asking for $19,000 to help us lift our organization off of the ground and provide us with the essential building blocks we need to start. With that money, we are gonna do 12 awareness campaigns over the next two years, giving these students those tools. One larger event every semester, bringing in a motivational speaker or a professional to guide these students. We also wanna send two of our students, the American College Healthcare Association in California this summer to where they'll come back with professional development and also knowledge for them to implement and be a great peer health educator. The regionals is in dire need of this and this is what they deserve. So I hope you all see this opportunity and allow us the ability to help these students for their success. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zoe. Next, we have Kicks Day, showcasing careers in quantitative science for high school girls, presented by Gabrielle Dawson. Hi, good evening. So I'm gonna start off with something really depressing. I am the only black woman in Miami University's physics department. Yeah, am I right? So, <laughs> According to a recent statistic, only 4% of all women um, who were in 2016 who received bachelor's degrees in physics were African American. And in case you were curious, that stat's largely unchanged. When I came to Miami, I was completely unaware that there was going to be a problem. I was in classes with predominantly male and pale people, um, and they didn't know how to deal with people like me who were outliers. And a lot of the time when you deal with data science and that kind of stuff, when you have outliers, you treat them as, okay, they're not a part of the majority, I don't care about them, I'm gonna treat them as noise. But when you have outliers like myself, we have to practice fragmentation and multiplicity. Essentially, when I enter a physics environment, I have to leave my black womanhood at the door or chip pieces of it away until I can fit the mold. So, what we are proposing with Kickstay is an opportunity for high school girls to come to Miami, find exposure, find representation, find mentorship with people like them who also find quantitative science thrilling, amazing, the future of what we're doing. Right, so we want this to be a full experience where girls to come, can come to campus, have interactive experiences with professionals, with professors, with college students, and with the campus and with the, um, with the subject matter at large. Right? So we want them to come and we want them to know that we have, we have a desk for them, that we have a lab table for them, and that we have a lectern with their name already on it. So what we're asking for is funding to be able to serve hot breakfast, hot lunch, that kind of stuff, have transportation for people from diverse high schools to be able to come in and experience the campus. We want them to be able to come in, enjoy our resources. We want them to come into classrooms, come into computer labs. Um, and we also want to be able to attract the kind of people who are going to be able to change these girls' lives for the better. I know when I was younger, having that kind of experience meant the world. I was able to go to my classroom. I went to an all-girls high school in St. Louis, right? So racial diversity wasn't like a huge issue. I had girls in my classroom. Um, and I was able to look around and the smartest girl in the classroom, the smartest person in the classroom was always a girl, right? So I was able to have those kind of experiences and not everybody can. And I want girls to be able to come to this campus, to come to Miami, and be able to see a classroom of people or a group of people who believe in them to know that they might be the smartest girl in the room or maybe they might be the smartest person in the room, right? So I want them to be able to have that kind of experience and I want them to be able to have that kind of experience at Miami, graduate, and bring that to the quantitative science field at large. So I believe that Kicks Day is the first step for Miami to be able to broaden their diversity so that I'm not the only black woman in the physics department anymore, right? I'd love to have more people like me there so that we can bring a breadth of diversity to the field uh, and to Miami. So thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Have a great night.
Thank you, Gabrielle. And next, we have the 50th anniversary of Title IX, A Legacy of Love and Honor, presented by Jen Gilbert. Thank you. My name's Jen Gilbert. I'm the Associate Athletic Director here at Miami, and I am a very proud Miami alum. Back on June 23rd, 1972, Congress passed into federal law the Title IX Education Act, which prohibits educational institutions from discriminating based on sex. A full 13 years later, in 1985, I arrived on campus as a volleyball student athlete. And while seven of us crammed all of our crap into a rented station wagon and drove each other to competitions, we watched our friends on the football team board charter buses. We played and practiced in the old Withrow Court because Millette Hall was the men's basketball arena. Some semesters, we actually started practice at 10 o'clock at night because priority scheduling the athletic facilities went to men's intramurals ahead of women's varsity sport. Now, we have a unique opportunity because on this 50th anniversary of the signing of Title IX, Miami Athletics wants to do something special to commemorate and celebrate just how far we've come. We have an opportunity and you have a chance to help invest with us, bringing back and inviting back 4,000 women to campus, former student athletes, former coaches, administrators, trainers to come back to campus in October and not only celebrate and enjoy the competitive events that are going on that weekend, but we envision a dinner with a keynote speaker where our alumni are seated at round tables with the young women from sport leadership and management department and our female student athletes, having them tell stories about how it was back in the day to young women who have no idea such discrimination ever existed. That's the first exciting part. Secondly, with all of those women coming back to campus, we have another unique opportunity. Research shows that young women are more successful when paired with a female mentor. Now we have all these women coming back to celebrate what Miami's experience meant to them. They're out in the workforce. Now we can connect those young women of SLAM and our female student athletes with women out in the career field, hoping for successful connections and first destinations out of Miami. Lastly, it gives us an opportunity to celebrate those memories. The women like me who came right after Title IX and we found the like-minded women who were competitive like us, that we knew it wasn't a tomboy phase we were going through. It was really an integral part of who we are. All of us are coming home to talk about what our Miami experience meant to us and our livelihoods now. And we can have conversations now on campus about paying it forward to protect women in sport with planned giving and supporting the women's sport endowments. We appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. And next we have Periods Rock, providing essential menstrual products to the Miami community, presented by Colleen Floyd. Hello everyone. So imagine this, you're on campus studying for a test and then, oh no, you get that feeling. This was supposed to happen tomorrow. You check your pockets, dig through your backpack, ask a friend, nobody has a powder tampon. So you're really panicked and you're like, okay, no, I remember some of the restrooms have product dispensers. So you take your card, go to the restroom and then dang it, these dispensers are coin operated. Isn't Miami supposed to be a cashless campus? Luckily you have a quarter. So you put it in there, the dispenser's empty. Dejected, you've done the tail little time of walking into the restroom, taking some toilet paper, wrapping it around your underwear and hoping it's gonna last. We all know it's not gonna last. So you're gonna go home, miss your classes and not have a great day. So what if instead, you go into the restroom and right there on the counter is quality pads and tampons ready to go whenever you need them, however you need it. You would feel so cared for and great knowing that you could get back to class afterwards and that there's people here looking after for you. 
Currently, this is what you can find in McGuffey and Phillips Hall because of the Periods Rock initiative. Periods Rock is a student-led, donation-driven program partnered with the Sexuality, sorry, Sexuality Education Study Center where we restock the restrooms every single week in the men's, women's, and all gender restrooms because we know at Miami, not everyone that menstruates are women. And we're trying to show care to our community no matter what time of the month. But we can do so much more and so can you. Right now, we have over 3,000 folks that we're helping every single week as they're going to classes. But with your help and this funding, we can extend it across the lane to King Library that's had over 300,000 student visits every single year before COVID-19. We're also looking to just make a map and survey what is the state of menstrual products on campus. And with your help, we can do that. Right now, you can find free products in McGuffey and Phillips Hall, as well as Armstrong Student Center, and we wanna expand that. This project would help us be a part of the initiative that can make this campus wide. We're building on a momentum that's already there. There's so many campus partners working on this. Student organizations, the associated student government, as well as faculty and staff. Help us be my, make Miami one of the forefronters, the leaders in this initiative to have free products available across the campuses. We're looking to do this. We need your help and we want to show that we can care for Miami students no matter what time of the month. Thank you. Thank you, Colleen. Next, we have mentoring program for TCPL faculty at Miami presented by Juana Kenworthy. everybody. Uh, I'm an associate teaching professor in the Global and Intercultural Studies uh, department at Miami. I have been here for 15 years. Um, I never had a mentor. I never had a mentor when I started grad school or when I started work at Miami. Never had a mentor when COVID hit and job uncertainty loomed large. I always wanted one. I just didn't know where to find the mentor. I'm not an, the only one in this situation. Um, let me explain the TCPL acronym. So there are two categories of faculty, continuing faculty at Miami. One is the research professor, the traditional research professor category. Uh, and these are the majority of uh, continuing faculty. But there's a second category that makes up about 25% of Miami's um, faculty and growing, uh, the teaching uh, clinical professors and lecturers. These are teaching stream faculty. 60% um, of this group are women. They come from a variety of backgrounds. Some come from the industry. Uh, others have uh, terminal degrees in their fields. Um, their responsibilities don't include research. They include ser university service and teaching. Uh, this group teaches large numbers of students. Um, they are a relatively new category at Miami. Um, unlike, and they depend on promotion for, for job retention because unlike research stream faculty uh, who have tenure, uh, the contracts of teaching stream faculty get periodically reassessed. Um, they're also a relatively new category at Miami and their position and promotion pathways have been formalized only in 2018. Um, having a mentor is crucial for new hires, especially after 2018. If they don't get promoted after five years, they uh, lose their jobs. <laughs> so mentoring is, is important for, um, for the career success of this group. Um, lack of mentoring um, is problematic for two reasons. First, faculty mentoring at Miami is not a given. Some departments have it, others don't. There's big uh, variation among divisions. And even where there are um, programs, they reflect the needs of research faculty. So in 2019, a grassroots initiative started a mentoring program. Your grant will help us formalize this. Start a mentoring library, get access to online resources, um, from the Mentoring Institute at University of New Mexico and hire an external trainer to give us formal training in the best mentoring pr uh, practices focused on the needs of teaching stream faculty. So we can continue to teach um, at Miami, thrive professionally and help deliver the great education Miami is known for. So thank you. Thank you, Juana. Next, we have open door closets Open Door Closed Closet, Phase Two, presented by Tina Coyne. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tina Coyne, and I am the Assistant Director of LGBTQ Plus Initiatives here at Miami. Our project might sound a little familiar to you, and that is because in 2020, your funding helped secure and build the resource, the Open Door Closed Closet, which provides 
trans and non-binary students with free clothing, accessories, shoes, and other things to aid them throughout their transitions. This is the first resource at a public institution in the state of Ohio, and that is because of all of you. I wanna give a quote from one of our students exit surveys. I haven't been shopping or in a fitting room environment in such a long time, I forgot how fun it could be. I'm excited and grateful for my new clothes. Even with all of this success, our trans and non-binary students are still facing discrimination from their community members and peers, financial, emotional, and physical rejection from their homes and families, threats of physical violence, and increased rates of depression, anxiety, and suicidality. We cannot change an entire culture, but we can expand upon the Open Door Closed Closets offerings to support our students in their time of need. The Chronicle of Higher Education made a video called Ask Me, which talked to trans and non-binary students about their experiences in public education. They feared being outed or found out by professors and fellow classmates, and this lack of affirmation and safety in the classroom can make it really hard to focus on your education if you're really distracted by the ways in which you're navigating space safely or having your basic needs met. So our expansion proposal addresses these disparities. And by expanding our size offerings, establishing gender affirming workshops to help folks through their transitions, and by purchasing packers, binders, and padded bras, we can help them soothe their gender dysphoria and help them pass to stay safe here on campus. By expanding our size offerings, we're better able to support our plus size students who might have a hard time finding clothing that fits them or works to their gender. By trans, because our trans and non-binary students are often cut off from their external support systems, we are trying to propose workshops that guide students through new tasks like applying makeup, um, having their uh, shaving and expressing mannerisms that align with their new gender. By participating in these workshops, students have the chance to learn basic skills that they might not otherwise have the opportunity to do. And lastly, the real world threat of physical violence does chase our students here on our trans and our non-binary students to protect themselves and navigate this campus and their communities safely. It's crucial that students have accessories like binders, packers, and padded bras to keep them safe in public space. So although this resource has done tremendous things so far for our students, there is still so much work we can do to aid and support them and to set them up for success here at Miami. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tina. Next, we have Sustainable Engineering for Water Sanitation in Rwanda, presented by Kate Brandt. How many of you in this room feel even the least bit inconvenienced when you have to take time out of your day to go to the store and buy groceries? Or when you have to wait for your water to boil when you just want your favorite pasta dish for dinner after a long day at work? And how many of you were able to go to high school and then had the opportunity and means to attend college? These things are tremendous privileges that we often take for granted or that even annoy us. And they're getting easier. I order my groceries ahead of time. I go to the store for five minutes. I'm in my car and I'm still not happy when I have to do it. Now let me paint a picture for you. You're a young girl in Eastern Africa where the days are hot and water is scarce. You go to primary school where you learn the basics of reading and math, but as you grow up, your brothers go off to secondary school, and your new job is to assist, your, assist and eventually take over water retrieval for your mother. So every day you wake up, you walk the five miles to the nearest water source, you fill up your jerry can, and you lug it back the five miles to your house. You have no time for anything else these days, and your opportunities to expand your education and leave your village one day are quickly dwindling. And this is where Engineers Without Borders comes in. We're an organization that empowers communities to meet their basic human needs while equipping leaders to solve the world's greatest challenges. The chapter here at Miami University is entirely student-led and sustained. And with the help of our faculty mentors and professional engineers, we have established a long-standing, strong relationship with the sector of Marumba, Rwanda, where we work to provide access to clean water. Over the next couple of years, our plans include rerouting our pipeline that is already there to a more dependable, larger water source, adding some additional storage into our system, and constructing new tap stands and treatment trains to meet the growing needs of the community. 
After its completion, this system will successfully bring clean water to over 5,000 people, and the women will not will no longer have to spend day in and day out collecting their water, but they will be able to go to school. And maybe one day they'll even study sustainability and engineering so they can be part of this achievement someday. If you choose to support our efforts, you will not only be supporting the women of Rwanda, but you will be supporting and enhancing the education of 30 young women eager to make a change in this world through engineering, a field that is nearly 80% male. Being a part of Engineers Without Borders and getting the opportunity to travel to Rwanda is an unmatched experience that allows us to cultivate the technical skills we learn in the classroom while learning interpersonal skills and developing a cultural competency. These things will put us ahead in our careers, will allow us to work as a team, and will allow us the opportunity to understand our, um, our capability so we can fight off denigration in the future. So we invite you to join us in our fight to knock down gender barriers here at home and around the world. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Kate. Next, Alumni Student Mentorship in Sports Leadership and Management, presented by Rebecca um, Yelstadt. This is a story of contradictions. In 2020, Kim Ng was named the first female general manager in Major League Baseball history. And just this year, and actually this month, Alyssa Nakin became the first female on-base coach. In 2022, the NCAA Women's National Basketball Championship game became the most watched men's or women's basketball game since 2008. However, women receive only 4% of sports media coverage around the world and only 14% of Division I athletic directors are female. Discrepancies like these are not found only in professional and collegiate sports, but also here at Miami. We have seen an underrepresentation of women within the Sport Leadership and Management, or SLAM, program here. In 2012, there were 187 SLAM, program, uh, SLAM students, and since then, we have seen the program grow up to four times the size, but the percentage of females within the program has remained largely unchanged at just 20%. As a student in SLAM, I have seen firsthand the inequities within the sports industry. I grew up in Cleveland and naturally loved sports. I dreamed of one day being a general manager within Major League Baseball. But this was hard for me at times, because even though I had parents who supported me in anything and everything I wanted to do, it's hard when you have a dream and nobody to look up to. There were no women of power in positions of power anywhere in sports, let alone in baseball. And I came to Miami hoping to find women in sports here, and that's not something even Miami had. So several other students and I decided to create Women in Sport Leadership, or WHISTLE, here on campus. And in just nine months and through a pandemic, we took our membership from eight to over 50 members. Now, since then, I have grown up and I have seen change, but it's not enough. I am speaking you to, to you today to help create a mentorship program unlike anything on Miami's campus. This will be a year-long program that will pair five alumni mentors with five current students here. And we hope that this will create a circle of connections that will allow students to become mentors in the future and take up that role. This will be a year-long program, like I said, and we'll have students meet with their mentors three times, twice on campus, and once at the mentor's place of work. So your financial support, if you grant it to us today, will allow us to create this program and hopefully will allow females to become confident and capable leaders within the sports industry. So when they are granted those positions of power, they can make long-term change. So that the little girls of today and tomorrow do have someone to look up to and can not only have dreams, but make those dreams a reality. Thank you, Rebecca. Next, we have Kara Strauss. Her project is Mia Michikua. Maui Pikuikui, also known as Coming Together as Miamia Women. Aya Cheiki, Te Pewe Neo Laka Koke Waha Nungi Kakikwe, La Kunza Kwa Wains Waane, Nila Miamikuya. Hello, everyone. My name is Kara Strauss. I'm a citizen of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma. And I just introduced myself to you in Miami Atawenge, the language of the Miami people. 
Now, this small act, an introduction, just a few sentences, is something that was not possible just a generation ago. Because of my community's experience of forced removals and forced assimilation, our language and culture went into decline, and the language ceased to be spoken in the middle of the 20th century. And this is why we need the work of the Miyamiya Center that is right here on Miami's campus and is working to reclaim language and culture in order to teach it in the Miyamiya community. So if the Miyamiya Center is already doing language and cultural revitalization, why do we need this project? Miyamikwia Mawip Yacheke, coming together as Miyamiya women. Well, first, it's because we've lost so much that it will take us decades to reclaim much of this information. And so if we have a topic that we're interested in, like women's roles and responsibilities in our community, we need to take the time to intentionally focus on it. Secondly, this work has to be done in community. And in order to make that happen in a community like mine that lives in diaspora, we have to bring together people from across the entire country in order to be able to do this work together in community. And lastly, even once we re reclaim this knowledge, we have to figure out ways of educating the rest of our community. And we plan to do that through this project with workshops with our Miami women who attend Miami University. This is not just about bringing together Miami women, though. It's about building a foundation of knowledge that can be passed on to future generations. So I am about to become Inga, or mother, and no, I am not pregnant, <laughs> but my sister is. And from a Miami perspective, her children are my children. And this is just one tiny example of a Miamia way of knowing that we need to explore further. And so we are asking for support to bring together Miamia women to build our knowledge so that we can pass it on to future generations. So, Mission Anyway, thank you very much. Ray Moore. Hi, my name is Alexis Raymore. I am a current freshman and vice president of Miami Women's D2 Club Ice Hockey. From the Southwest Project, we have been told that we're too greedy and aggressive in developing our program and what we want to stand for. And in a male-dominated sport such as ice hockey, hearing that you're asking for too much by stating your basic needs of the program is really disheartening. Whether that be requesting ice time earlier than midnight or protective gear, <laughs> um, we have consistently been pushed away regardless of our needs. Does this make you angry? I know that everyone here has been told that they can't do something and still have fought for it. And it's been hard to gain credibility and support as a program just starting out. And for this community, this is a common problem. And we, as Miami Women's D2 Club Ice Hockey, want to be the stepping stone for the success of later women coming into this program. As a recently developed team in the last few years, we have not been given the right tools for the proper foundation. And we have consistently been pushed to the side, whether that be lack of funding, exposure, or support. If we do not have these tools to support our dedication to getting better, we cannot market ourselves to later girls coming into this program. And if we want this team's legacy to last a lifetime, we must first build a reputation of success. And this is more than just winning games and having big trophies. This is about personal and collective growth over time. We are driven and dedicated to the success of this program. However, we lack the funding to support our drive. And we envision developing a better culture in sports by evolving the idea that women should be taken seriously. And we are in the right position and place as a team to change the stigma of women being too greedy or passionate or aggressive for supporting the things that we believe in. I and everyone else on Miami Women's Do Hockey is driven and dedicated to the success of this program, not only for the time that we spend here, but for the years to come when we're gone. We are ready and willing to put in the work to get better, and your generous gift will allow us to dedicate more time to on-ice training and lower the dues of incoming players in hopes that we can grow this expanding program. By setting aside more time for individual improvement and team development, we are creating a legacy of success for ourselves that show other women coming to our program our group values. Throughout the many years that we played hockey, we have always been taught a core set of values, and we've instilled the belief that we foster humble and dignified players who value unity and diversity, and we are dedicated to creating a legacy of leadership. We are in the right place and position as a team for success that will last beyond our time here in Miami. 
And with your gift, we are not only setting ourselves up for success, but for the women who come after us. We are in the, with this gift, we are creating a program that is structured around the character and culture that is committed to creating a legacy of love and honor. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Thank you, Alexis. Next, we have Identity Library presented by April Callis. All right, hello, everybody. I'm April Callis, and I work in the Center for Student Diversity and Inclusion, or CSDI. So I want to start out with some numbers for you all. 578. That's the number of books that we currently have in our library. Three, that's the number of books in our library published in the last 10 years. In fact, the average age of the books in our library, 29 years old. The average age of students using our library or hoping to use our library, 20 years old. So there's about a decade of difference there. And when we are talking about books around gender and sexuality, race and ethnicity, the way that we talk about these things has changed a lot in the last few decades. There's a book in our library right now that I looked at today called Masculinity and Femininity that says that gay and bisexual identities are sexual maladjustments and sexual deviance and says that they are caused by overbearing mothers and by narcissism. By the way, these things are not true. Uh, so <laughs> students aren't utilizing the library for obvious reasons. Uh, we have about 60 students coming into our space every day. Uh, we've had less than a dozen books checked out in the last year. But students tell us that they are interested in books where they can see their identities reflected to them. The Center for Student Diversity and Inclusion, our mission is to be affirming students, to be providing a welcoming space. And this is something we could be doing through our library, but we're not right now. And so the answer is a reimagining of this library. And what does that look like? So number one, we're going through right now and we are uh, retiring the books that include these stereotypes that we don't need to be having there. If a book is old, that doesn't mean it doesn't have academic merit, but it doesn't need to be in a space where we are trying to uplift marginalized students. But two, we are going to be purchasing new contemporary books, and this is where we could use your help. What we would like to do is purchase 141 books, uh, contemporary books, and focusing on graphic novels and young adult fiction, because this is what students have told us they want, and also, this is what research shows us um, is great for affirming identity. These books are going to provide windows and mirrors to our students, mirrors reflecting their own identities back to them, and windows where they can learn about identities that they don't hold. With your donation, we'll be able to start this in fall of 2022. Thank you so much. Thank you, April. Next, we have Mental Health First Eight presented by Erica Crawford. Thank you. So my name is Erica Crawford and I work for Miami University Regionals. And I wanna start off by telling you a little story. When I myself was going through my senior year of college, I went through a pretty bad time with my mental health. I was sleeping all the time, I had no motivation to do anything, and was just overall in a pretty bad space. I knew that we had counseling resources on campus, but to be honest, I was way too intimidated to go there. So instead, I talked to my academic advisor. While this person certainly meant well and tried to provide me with the supports that I needed, it was clear they didn't really understand what I was going through. Unfortunately, my story is not unique. About one in three college students will experience symptoms of anxiety, depression, or substance use during their college years. And with the COVID-19 pandemic, we know that number has only continued to grow. When I recently spoke with counseling services on the regional campus, they told me this is the first time they can remember that they've ever had a waiting list for students trying to get appointments. They also told me that they've been bombarded with faculty and staff reaching out for them, 
looking for additional resources or training materials to better support the students in front of them. Because similar to my own story, college students are much more likely to talk to someone they know, a familiar faculty or staff member, than they are to just go straight to counseling services. For this reason, we have to make sure that everyone across campus is ready to have those conversations. This is where mental health first aid comes in. Mental health first aid is a nationally recognized program that trains people not to be the emergency department, but how to provide the basic supports for someone who may be experiencing symptoms of depression, anxiety, trauma, psychosis, or substance abuse. It's rooted in resiliency and recovery. It breaks down the stigmas around mental health and it provides practical hands-on skills for everybody. With your gift of just $6,400, we can get two individuals at Miami University Regionals certified to provide this training to other faculty and staff across the campus. This grant would cover the materials for the first 100 people to go through the training, where they themselves would be certified in mental health first aid, and they would get a guidebook that has helpful information, tips, and national resources that they can keep on hand or they could give to a student in need. Oh man. <laughs> These trainings are also designed to be completed very quickly so they can be done in just one day. So this is a really fast and effective way for us to empower our faculty and staff to help students right there on the spot and alleviate some of that pressure from counseling services. Earlier I talked about my own struggles with mental health, struggles that still go on today. As a person with anxiety, being up here and making this ask is the hardest thing I've ever made myself do. <laughs> but I'm here and I'm doing it because I know that mental health is bigger than me or any one of us. Together, we can help support students right where they are. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Next, we have Miami Women in Naval Science Outreach Program, presented by Maya Smith. Good evening. Judging by the audience here tonight, I think it's a safe assumption to make that many of you have been the only woman in the room before. A lot of times entering that room, you are loud and proud. It's motivating. But sometimes you wish as though you had someone in that room who could relate to you a little bit better. Sometimes it's disheartening. But have you been the only woman in your entire institution? I'm the only woman to wear this uniform on campus. I'm the only woman at Miami to wear this uniform in the past six years. One of the missions of the Naval Reserve Officer Training Corps program is mentorship. They provide college students with active duty staff members to um, give us information about the fleet, about active duty life, and to provide their mentorship to us. But in my time here at Miami, there has never been a female staff member in our unit. In the, on the Navy side, in both the freshman and sophomore classes, there's only one female in each class. So without a female staff member to go to for advice and without peers to reach out to, who are they supposed to go to? Each year, our command releases a survey that asks for issues going on in the command as well as levels of morale. This year, the morale among female midshipmen in the unit was at an all-time low over my last three years here. It is easy for morale to fall and for us to feel as though we are not represented when we are so small in numbers. With the presentation of this grant, it would allow us to attend the Naval Women's Service, Women Naval, excuse me, Women and Naval Service Symposium each year, as well as other conference opportunities that may arise. This would provide us with the opportunity to network, as well as to hear about the experiences and opportunities from women in the Naval Services. This would also give us an opportunity to meet a national community of female midshipmen. This would serve as leadership training, as well as provide us a way to raise our morale. This would serve as a reminder that we are not alone in the fleet and not alone in the fight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maya. Next, we have Culinary Nutrition Depot presented by Nancy Parkinson. Thank you for this opportunity to be here 
to talk about the Culinary Nutrition Depot. Recently, I had a conversation with a student, a first year, and he said that this past fall, he actually lost 15 pounds instead of gaining 15 pounds. Through his participation in the Culinary Nutrition Depot, Lunch and Learn food demonstration, and online pick list food pantry program, he has learned more about nutrition and how to stabilize his weight to get, have a healthy weight. That was awesome news for me. Nancy Parkinson, a registered dietitian nutritionist, clinical faculty member here at Miami University. And I am so proud and privileged to work with Miami University students. In our research, in our work, we surveyed Miami University students and we found that two thirds of those students knew of someone who only had one meal per day. They also found that there were students that did not have all of the foods, your grains, your proteins, your dairy, your fruit, and your vegetables a day. We also found in our research that the cost of higher education is increasing. Textbooks, food, living expenses, tuition. And so we've, we realized that there was a need on this campus to provide access to healthy food. Now you may be familiar with the term food insecurity, but we want to say a person has, needs access to healthy food for whatever reason. We, that's why we developed the Culinary Nutrition Depot with two aspects, the uh, Pickless program and the um, Nutrition Education Lunch and Learn weekly program. We have had 220 um, kits distributed, we have had 280 participants, and we have distributed 34 online pick list programs. Your support will help us to continue that program. It will also help us to provide a variety of foods for our diverse population. I am so thankful that you are listening to what we do. We give free cookbooks. I'm a cookbook person, and we give free cookbooks. Free door prizes and a produce bag that keeps your produce fresher for longer. So the students are loving it. We are loving it. And as my students told me, if you provide someone with food, you also need to educate them on how to use it. And that's the nuts and bolts of our program. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Next, we have expansion of the Miami University Rowing Club Women's Fleet, presented by Ella Catlick. Home, what does that word mean to you? Is it a person, a place, or an object? Well, to me, home is our boathouse, which houses 68 students that started as my teammates and transformed into my family and friends. When I first came to Miami, I felt lost and disconnected. However, when I joined the Miami University Rowing Club, that gap was bridged and it all found a place. Now our team has made a promise to our athletes that the sport of rowing here at Miami be affordable to all. That promise is becoming hard to uphold. With the team's financial constraints, we have recently had to depend, recently had to increase our funds, our dues from $300 to $350 per semester. Sadly, some students cannot afford that fee. So we've had to depend on our alumni, friends, and family for continued support. Currently, our men's team has a more modern fleet by a far stretch. They were the last to receive two new boats, unlike the women. Also, the newest boat that they received was purchased by reallocating funds that were originally saved up for the women because at the time, the men needed it more. So the women have been patiently waiting. One issue is that these shells are specifically built according to weight classes. So that prevents cross compatibility between the men and the women's squad. Trust me, we'd use our boats if we could. Also, our women's squad currently can compete and train on boats that are 20 to 22 years old. That means that these boats that the women are in are actually older than them. So <laughs> we encountered the reliability and safety of these boats exponentially decreases as they age. We encountered this during spring of 2021 when one of our men's boats capsized due to equipment failure. 
Also, our spring 2022 tryouts brought nearly 20 new members for the team, so that creates an increased need for newer equipment. Our executive board believes that since the men's team has been fortunate enough to receive the newest boats, it is their goal to provide the women's team with boats that make our fleet balanced and fair. So our project is geared towards purchasing a four-person shell for the women's team. The men's team currently has two four-person shells, where the women's team only has one. So obtaining this new shell would greatly benefit all 35 women, as it would be used by both the varsity and novice women. Our club takes great pride in the preservation and conservation of our equipment that we have obtained over the club ex existence because it advances our team. Also, the results will automatically be seen on the water as a woman will show better results in competitions with a newer and faster boat. Additionally, we want to grow our team with the women and the future generations of Miami Visitor Rowers to have more reliable and safer equipment. Also, if we were to see this grant, we would Really appreciate if the Miami Women's Giving Circle would have the honor in naming this boat and join us for a naming ceremony. So we are asking for this grant to have the power to invest and further grow our team into its fullest potential. Thank you for your time and consideration on behalf of the Miami University Rowing Club. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ella. Well, I am not sure about you, but man, they were all impressive, weren't they? Woo! I am just one really proud Miami mom right now. So while well, you have a very difficult job because we remember those numbers that we were talking about. Now, you know, I'm a physicist, so numbers I can sort of deal with. So I have a way that we could possibly make this job easier next year. Any suggestions on that? I think we get the point, right? So if you know some other women or maybe some of you watching that are just as impressed as I am, please think about maybe, you know, joining the Miami Women Giving Circle. And now I would like to ask Emily Berry, Assistant Vice President of Annual Giving, to walk us through that very important next phase, casting our votes. Thank you very much. Thanks, Renata. Uh, telling a story like that in such a short amount of time is not an easy thing to do, especially in front of a group of people. So please join me in uh, congratulating the presenters one more time. I would also like to thank Professor Beth, Beth Troy from the Entrepreneurship Department for helping to train the presenters and giving them advice on how best to do their pitches tonight. So thank you, Beth. At this time, we'll ask our Giving Circle members to vote on your top funding priorities. Please check your email. Um, you should have an email from me from about eight o'clock this morning uh, with a link to the online voting form. If you have any questions or need assistance with voting, Amy and I will be right there to uh, assist you throughout the rest of our evening. Voting closes at 10 p.m., so please make sure to submit your votes prior to that time. For those of you watching along at home, uh, we are also available uh, via email or through text message and our contact information can be found in the same email that I sent this morning. We will tabulate the votes and announce our grant recipients tomorrow at the Women's Leadership Symposium and the Hawk Tank Awards will take place at lunchtime. Thanks everyone for attending tonight and please enjoy the post-event reception. Cast your votes and have a great night. Thank you.